Studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sinners, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sinners, let's go down, down in the river to pray. Good, Mike. Good 
morning. We're glad that y'all are here with us this morning. We pray that the breeze will keep up. Uh, it is a joy to see all of you. Uh, let us worship God now and turn our hearts to the Lord. Hear now our call to worship. I trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Good morning. It's so nice to see all of you here. We're going to sing an old faithful song this morning. morning it's so good to gather together these are some strange times we're living in and I'm sure that's the understatement not only of the year but perhaps of the decade um, this dust is so odd and, and I'm sure you've all read about it the Saharan layer that has descended over us um, but there's so much that we are still thankful for um, even as we kind of stare up and, and wonder and maybe that's Maybe that's the point, that we're to stare up and wonder um, that there's mystery in this world and we're not always as knowledgeable as we think we are. So with that, let us go to God in prayer. Please bow your heads with me. Almighty Father, we come to you this morning, a grateful people, a bemused people. Lord, let us just understand that we don't fully understand and that that's okay because that's where faith comes in. We trust you, Lord. We obey you, Lord. We listen for you, Lord. And for myself and maybe others, that's the hardest part. Just the sitting and waiting and listening for you, for your voice, for how your spirit moves among us. Let it move our hearts. Let it move our minds. Let it move our hands and feet as you would call us to do and be. Sometimes it's more important to just be. And right now, Lord, help us to just be. Help us to learn how to sit in silence with you and be okay with it. Not always having to be busy. Not always having to talk. But just to listen. Open our spiritual eyes and ears this morning. Open up our hearts and minds. 
so that the words that Larry and Mike and others bring to us this morning, that we truly hear them, that we allow them to move us to be ever more like you. All of these things we ask in your beautiful son's name. Amen. awesome to see you out there as it is every week so far. Um, I mean, I'm not about numbers at all, but it looks like we're growing a little bit. So um, it's always good when more bacon gets in the pan to fry, right? So, uh, I'm all for it. Keep coming. Um, today's passage comes from Genesis chapter 22. I'm going to read it. Mindful that y'all are hot. Mindful that still have a sermon to preach, but we're going to get through this. So Lord, uh, thank you so much for your word. I pray that now as it's read, you'll speak. I pray that as it is preached, you'll speak. This in Christ's name, amen. Genesis 22, sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied, then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Early the next morning, Abraham got up, saddled his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. When they reached the place God had told them about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac laid him on the altar, on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand, he took the knife to slay his son, but the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over, took the ram, and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, on the mountain of Yahweh, it will be provided. This is the word of the Lord, and thanks be to God. So, uh, we have, Houston, we have a problem, right? We have a big, big, big biblical problem with this story. First of all, God tested Abraham. I already do not like anything that's going to come after that statement. God tested 
Abraham raises more questions for me than it answers. Yet, that's where we are. And after we read verse 2, we know that something's fishy here if we've been following Scripture up to this point. We understand this motif of God asking Abraham to embark with no guidance system or no flight plan. We get it. We've seen it before. But how can God ask for a human sacrifice? How can God ask for a human sacrifice? Even more, how can God ask Abraham to kill the one, the only child of the promise? If God allows Isaac to be murdered, sacrificed, slaughtered, then God has worked against God's self and made God's very self a liar. So, when I'm trying to understand a story like this, I immediately just do this. I am way out of my league. So, I look to those who read better than I do. Not just biblically. I need somebody who reads literature, who understands how stories work and understands how language works. So I look to a guy named David Rosenberg. He is a poet, but more so than just a poet, he is a Hebrew poet. He is a Hebrew translator. He is a Hebrew speaker of, of both biblical Hebrew and Yiddish. So he's going to have some feel for what might be going on here. David Rosenberg uh, wrote a book called A Literary Bible where he takes uh, parts of scripture and interprets them using his sense of poetry and literature and also his understanding of the language. When he comes to this passage, he says this passage most resembles a dream. Now my brother is speaking my language. This, the way he understands, the way the language is moving, the way it's structured, the pieces of this story, the way the tension builds, he says it reads most like a dream. Now, I read an article the other day that talked about how, you know, in the midst of, um, we were just laughing back here, murder hornets, um, in the midst of protesting and all that we're seeing on TV, in the midst of a virus that's, um, you know, doing what it's doing to us. Uh, now we have this apocalyptic dust cloud that's coming over. It looks like a Spider-Man movie I saw once. I mean, we are having more dreams these days, according to this article. And not just having more dreams, but we're having more memorable dreams. And if you've ever done any kind of dream work, hear what I just said. Memorable dreams. If you remember your dreams, then we're getting a message. So, Rosenberg says this story reads like a nightmare, not just a dream, but a nightmare. Now, if you've ever had a nightmare, you have, you probably remember a nightmare. As a matter of fact, I would bet you there are people that are frying right now in this parking lot who remember maybe a nightmare they once had as a child. And here you are already, um, whatever age you are, and you still remember that nightmare, right? A nightmare, if you've ever done dream work, you know that a nightmare is the unconscious mind trying to get your attention, trying to get the attention of your ego or your conscious mind. You probably, like I say, recall one of those. And if you recall a nightmare, good. It means that it worked. Now, though, what next? That's where dream work comes in. Now it's your work to explore the terrifying aspects of that nightmare, the things you don't want to look at, the things that, that made you wince and made you want to run and wake up, but you couldn't to go back to those places in your mind and try to figure out what is going on there if you want to discover what that unconscious message to you is. I want to approach this passage like David Rosenberg as a dream, because then I can deal with it. I can't deal with this passage if it's not a dream, because it goes against everything I am, everything I understand about God, everything I've ever read in the Bible. So 
But if I look at it as a dream, now I can deal with it. So let's approach it as a dream. So we'll do the surface work. We'll skim the elements. I'll be quick. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to speak in first person because in dream work, the phrase is not, hey, you had this dream and this is what you dreamt. No, it's, if it were my dream, you see, just using that language, if it were my dream, see, now I can walk with you in that dream. I can understand what it feels like to be in that dream. But keep this in mind as we proceed. Emotions and dreams are everything. I cannot tell you. You might say, well, I'm not an emotional person. I would say, in your unconscious, you are nothing but emotions. So emotions are everything in the unconscious and in your dreams. So if you remember nothing else, you will remember from your dream how you felt when you woke up or when you remember that dream, how it feels to remember that dream. So that's where I want to focus today. So what we're going to do, it's going to be weird. I'm going to enter into this dream and going to take you with me. I'm going to use I language, first person language. But every time you hear me say I, me, or my, I want you in your heart to say I, me, or my. I want you to enter into this dream with me. And let's see what we find there, okay? Now the dream. Again, I'm Abraham. So I'm up. In this dream, I wake up. Having woken only to wish it were a dream, I do all the aggravating work of preparing for what I know could take days, this journey. Provisions for the four of us prepped. I need wood. Each downward swing of the axe splits the fibery wood. I see every fiber split in this wood. Is it my soul splitting? Both my soul, this wood, will soon fuel the fire to the unimaginable. To boot, there's the added stress of having no idea which mountain in Moriah God is talking about. Worst of all, there's this knot in my throat, heavy as a boulder. Nobody knows what I know, that this journey will end in the slaughter of my own flesh and blood. The dream continues, and for whatever reason, I look up as we journey. My gut drops in fear. There's the mountain God intends. Having arrived, now I must tell a lie. I lie to my two companions, saying, the boy and I will worship. We will be back. I can't risk alarming them. Swallowing emotion is like drinking poison. And in this world of the unconscious self, there's no elixir, nowhere for me to hide. So I knowingly lie. I lie boldly. The moment in my dream, it keeps building I know I can't carry everything. I would if I could, though. Matter of fact, I would change places with my child in a heartbeat. Yet I can't risk giving him the knife. And I can't risk giving him the flame. What if he suspects something and throws the knife or extinguishes the flame? My heart winces at the sight. My own child bearing the weight of the pyre before it scorches. He has no idea of my evil means to his certain end. The nightmare presses on mercilessly. The child asks the exactly the right question, wondering 
why there's no sacrificial animal. And then I tell the biggest lie of all, answering almost condescendingly. God will provide? No, God has provided. And why has God forsaken me? I'm hamstrung. I, I want to scream out in objection and anguish, but to maintain this night terror of a calm presence is the only mercy now that I can show my son. My hands are trembling nonstop as I try to build this altar of sacrifice. Here, Dad, let me help you. He notices my weakness. That's what this child says that I'm to murder. And now he becomes an accomplice in this crime that's befalling him. The child only wants to help to make me proud. See, my ambiguous answer to his question, my dishonesty, only motivated him to even be better than he already is. So we work this work, our last work, together. He pondering the lesson in faith, and I already dead inside. The altar built, we set the wood aright. I bind my own child who never saw it coming. Now we both tremble as I place him on the pyre. Secrets out. The betrayer is now exposed. The liar is revealed. The evildoer is made known. I, it is I, the true monster of this nightmare. I grab the knife, raising it in full abandonment. It's the point of no return. Now, I got to wake up at this point, for me personally. I got to come up for air. See, for me, there's no processing what happens next. There's no processing verses 11 and 12. It reeks of sick, divine humor of a cruel God. So I don't go there. So I wake up here, and let me conclude by giving you just some ideas to take into your own working of this dream. And I hope that's what will happen. I hope you go back and read this and work it yourself as if this were your dream. As you do, remember that mining these unconscious messages, it's an ongoing process. There's no one meaning to this dream. There's no one swept through, you get it, you get the answer. No, this is a process that you carry with you and you work this every day of your life. Think of it as a gift from something bigger than you are. Everything that we encounter in a dream, every minute detail is a projection of yourself. Everything you see in a dream is part of you. Every person you meet in a dream is part of you. Keep that in mind as you work this dream. And the key to unlocking the meaning of each of these details that you're going to meet with this dream is how do I feel when I meet these certain things? How do these details make me feel? Think of those details as symbols. For example, here, the, the, one of the most symbolic, <clears throat> most powerful symbols in this dream is a ram caught in the thickets. Doesn't mean much to you unless you keep rams. Do we do that? I don't even know where rams live. The zoo, I guess. So a ram caught in the thickets is the powerful. And as symbols go... Think about a ram. What does a ram do? A ram embodies a very masculine energy, doesn't it? A ram goes through this world pounding its way through life. 
the, the thicket, think about that. It embodies more of that feminine energy. What does a thicket do? A thicket works on the cycles of nature. A thicket has no strength of its own. It's made up of tiny little vines and, and limbs that you could simply break one by one with your fingertips. But the nurturing mother lured the pompous bulldozer into her welcoming wood only to turn on him and trap him without flexing a muscle. You see, he entangles himself in her. For the dreamer of this dream, it would appear that the inner world is way out of bounds. The inner world is in turmoil. Masculinity reigns and the feminine has been forced into the shadows. An imbalanced inner world is a chaotic outer world. Whether we're talking about individuals, whether we're talking about societies, whether we're talking about the whole world. So it's also helpful to remember in context here that Abraham is from Mesopotamia. Abraham is not a Christian. Abraham is not a Jew. Hello, right? Abraham is pre-everything that we hold dear and near and think that's just... And that's why Paul, we talked about it a few weeks, when Paul needed to throw us on our heads, what did he do? He went back to Abraham because Abraham is before all of that, right? But where is Abraham from? He's from Ur of the Chaldees, right? He is a Mesopotamian. He believes in a whole pantheon of gods. Enlu, Enu, Anu, right? He's got all of these gods he believes in. And yet he's been met with this Yahweh who's been trying to get his attention. The ram in that culture represents the goddess Ishtar, a spoiled brat temptress of that culture's pantheon. And such a dream for Abraham just might represent an insider's view of one who had left the culture of his fathers and now learns how to be his own man in his own land with his own God. He's becoming an individual. And this journey entails the trial and the error and the adjustment that it takes to strike out on your own and to be your own person and to find your own relationship with God. So you'll have to take this dream in Genesis 22 and work it for yourself. But I believe verse 14 gives us one of those nuggets. Usually when you wake up from a nightmare, from a, from a meaningful dream, there's this one tune or this one line or this one verse or this one weird saying that just is like a mantra. Man, it is stirring and it is it will not go away. Or this one feeling or this one scene in that dream. Right? That is your entry point. That is where you go back to so that you can enter back into this deep, dark wood of your unconscious. Verse 14, I believe, is that entry point for Abraham. Verse 14 is that nugget, that, that thing I'm talking about. What is it? It repeats over and over. It will be provided on Yahweh's mountain. It will be provided on Yahweh's mountain. In other words, of all the mountains, as I uh, can't think of her name, Miley Cyrus told us, there's always going to be another mountain, right? So the thing, y'all, I hope you don't know that song. But anyways, um, the idea being that there's always going to be a journey. But the dream is telling Abraham, no, -uh, it's on Yahweh's mountain. It's on the journey Yahweh has laid out before you. In other words, trust in your God now. Trust in who you are becoming and who Yahweh is leading you to be. So may we discern between mountains. In the name of the Father, 
in the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Let us affirm our faith now using the Apostles' Creed as our guide. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I think Stephanie has our prayers of the people and has gathered those up. But let us come now to God. And let us, let us begin our prayers with a moment of silent meditation on our lives and the world. Let us pray. O oh God, we are thankful that you have heard the prayers of our heart. We are mindful of the world that we live in and its chaos and its sinfulness and destruction. As Isaiah said, I am a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips. Cleanse me. We ask that you would cleanse us, O oh God. Not that we may be righteous to tell everyone what to do, but that we may be forgiven to tell good news to others who are in need of forgiveness. We are surrounded by so much brokenness. Help us to be people who can heal that brokenness. Help us to listen, as St. Francis said, rather than to talk. Help us to seek to be he healers and not be healed. God, for those who are wounded in our world by racism, by oppression, by poverty, we give thanks for them and pray for them. For those of us who were wounded by wealth, by privilege, by lacking total dependence on God, we ask that you would help us also. Remind us all of our common humanity that is in need of healing no matter what station we are at in the world. We pray also not just for individuals today, but we pray for those systems that we live in. Most importantly for us, we pray as a church and help us to be, as a church, a community that tells of your good news, that tells of your love, that goes out into the world to set things right and to tell the world of a God who loves them. Help our systems in hospitals, in schools, in government, in police, in military, all of our systems. Help us to work for goodness and grace. We pray so much, O oh God, for this world that is torn apart by disease, by feelings of disunity, of fear. Help us not to be held captive to our fears. Help us to be faithful and wise Help us to be nurturing and loving. We pray for all of those who are sick, O oh God. We ask that your mercies be with them, that the knowledge and love and care of doctors and nurses and therapists come to bear on their illness. And we pray that we would be with their families and with them in this time of illness. 
We pray for those who are, are worried or fearful about hunger or about what tomorrow might bring. Help us to work for a better tomorrow, but to remind them that Christ died on a cross for us to make the world better. We pray for our leaders, for our President Donald, for our Governor Henry, and for our Mayor here in Blythewood. We pray for all health workers. We pray for all who want society to be better and for all who are charged with keeping society in order and in good health. Be with all of them, we pray. And we pray now the prayers of our very congregation and our very people. We're thankful for our great niece, Raylan McCorkle. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Continued prayers for Madeline and healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray for John Garris, who is undergoing chemo and fighting cancer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Prayers for session members today in decision making. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For people traveling and ignorance with this COVID-19 for all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Miss Amelia Cotty, who has a return of her cancer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Continued prayers for Anne and Tony as they fight with dementia and caretaking at home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Jeremy Rogers and family, Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayers. For Gwen's friend Julie for a brain tumor removal and hopefully negative results. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For all that who serve and protect us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Sam's sister Jennifer, who just had surgery. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Bill's sister-in-law Paige, with continued treatment for cancer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And thanksgiving for all who participated in the mission trip and uh, the good work that you did this week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Matthew, for his decision to join the National Guard. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For Harry and Carter, for peace and grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For us to remember Frog, or to fully rely on God in these uneasy days. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. For continued guidance in life's choices, we know, God, that you are with us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Continued prayers for Sandra Hensley to come home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And for the ability to fall just really low to the ground and not hurt yourself, for Charlotte, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And hear our prayers as we pray the prayer you taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and glad Stephanie mentioned it in the prayer. Um, the elders, elders, we will meet right after this. I'm going to ask, uh, I know this sounds rude, uh, but because of what's on our uh, agenda to do today, uh, I'm going to ask that you not dilly-dally, that we just, um, as soon as we say amen here, that we kind of get in here and get working. Um, 
Something you guys may or may not know, but Don Wilson is going to be joining our church, so that's one of the cool things we get to do today is run Don through the uh, through the Presbyterian gauntlet. Yeah, it's real simple, Don. I told him I'll just tell him what to say. He can say it if he agrees with it. Um, but so we'll do that officially, and then the next time we get inside this building, we're going to um, have a, a reception, uh, not like a food reception, but a, a liturgical reception for him. So... Um, but anyways, look, as we go from here today, uh, let us go now mindful. Mindful of the unconscious world of Abraham that is shared with us, right? Mindful of a God who reaches out to us in ways that are greater than we can reach inside of ourselves. And may we go mindfully that we might hear those messages and spend time working with those messages because I believe that God is shaping ever, each and every one of us and that we become individuals for God, but individuals together for God. So as we go, let us go in that spirit today. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine upon you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you and give you peace in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Old time religion, give me that old time religion.